well and then get ready to go. We're good. All right, hey everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, for the sake of the camera, this is the San Francisco PHP Meetup Group. Um, hopefully you all know that. Um, if not, that's okay. You'll learn something in addition. Um, tonight we have a Steve Corona. Can you say your last name? Corona, light over here, all right. So he'll be talking tonight about uh, how scaling lamp doesn't have to suck. Um, sponsors tonight, Constant Contact. Uh, they're providing the food and the facilities, so big thanks to them. Uh, we have a raffle tonight from O'Reilly. We have three books to give away from them. Um, we also have um, uh, da, 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 PHP, I believe we have, from, from who? Uh, JetBrains. Sorry, JetBrain, uh, JetBrains will be like, uh, wrapping off one of their IDEs. Uh, so we'll have that. Uh, we have Mashery who's sponsoring Jacob's time and Lithium uh, who's sponsoring my time. Uh, so a big shout out to all those sponsors, thank you very much. Uh, upcoming events on May 28th, uh, we're doing a joint group uh, down the street at uh, App Dynamics. Um, that'll be with the Symphony Group. Uh, Fabian will be in town and he'll be giving a future of basically Symphony and PHP uh, talk. And so that should be really fascinating. Uh, if you haven't already signed up for that, there's a, it's a big facility so we can pack a whole lot of people in there. I highly recommend it. Um, coming up in June, we're going to have Jacob uh, give a talk about uh, basically programming languages, how to create them, what they do when you parse them, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, should have been more prepared. I can't remember it off the top of my head. So anyway, uh, that'll be a really interesting one uh, about creating what goes into creating programming languages. Um, what's that? One? What's that? That one. Uh, that'll be sometime in June. SFPHP.org. June 25th. What's that? June 25th. June 25th. The day before um, my birthday. Day before his birthday. So we'll uh, we'll see if we can get some cake or something too. <laughs> um, so as usual, uh, we have a good turnout tonight. Um, if everybody who's looking to be hired could raise their hand. I know there's some more of you out there. Come on. All right. So I know there's a lot of you out there who are looking to hire people. Hopefully you saw those hands. Afterwards, go meet up with them, find them. Uh, that's where the resources are going to be to get you that job. Uh, and with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. All right, so tonight I'm going to give you a quick presentation on scaling WIMP. Um, kind of like the 80 20, if you will, of like, how to scale really fast without having to know a lot about scaling. Uh, so let's go on this little journey around how to scale. Uh, really quickly, he said, I'm Steve Corona. I wrote a book called Scaling PHP. I work at Light360. I'm head of API there. Um, this talk and kind of the examples are based on my experiences, right? It's like real world stuff. We do 800 million API calls a day, so it's not theory. It's not something I learned in a book. It's like shit I got my hands dirty doing and made a presentation on it. So hopefully it's useful to you. So let's learn how to scale PHP in 40 minutes, or maybe less. I don't know if it's going to go that long. Hopefully not. I tend to talk fast. Um, to start the talk, I'm going to kind of make an outrageous claim that it's going to like sound kind of right at first, and then it's kind of going to break apart and not really make sense. But I'll go with it. The outrageous claim is that scaling PHP doesn't matter. Scaling code doesn't matter. Your code doesn't matter at all. In fact, your code is the easiest part of your stack to scale. So when you have a lot of traffic, when you have like millions of users hitting at the same time, the part that you should be not looking at, that you should be looking at the least, is your code. Because that doesn't matter. It's easy. So if scaling is easy, then what's this talk about? It's really about scaling your infrastructure, scaling your stack, scaling the LAMP stack, scaling the things that the PHP talks to that's not actually your code. Because like I said, your code doesn't matter at all. And inevitably, if you Google like scaling PHP, you'll read Stack Overflow for hours and find like idiots that don't know what they're talking about. And you'll learn that the way you scale PHP is by replacing double quotes with single quotes because that actually makes it faster and all this weird stuff that is actually not true. What you need to scale is your LAMP stack. So I hope everyone here knows what a LAMP stack is. But just in case, if there's anyone here that doesn't know, we'll just talk about it really quickly. LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Please, I hope everyone knows that. 
Um, so we want to take this lamp stack and we want to swap out the shitty parts. We want to swap out the parts that are going to fail, they're going to let you down, they're going to wake you up in the middle of the night. We want to replace those with parts that are scalable, reliable, fast, redundant. So we have Linux. Well, let's keep Linux because it's awesome, but maybe we can tune a little bit. Maybe we can do some things that will make it faster, that will make it more performance, performant, whatever. <laughs> Apache. We love Apache, but we hate Apache. We get rid of Apache. Out of our, in our new stack, we're not going to have Apache because it uses a lot of memory. It doesn't really work awesome at high scale unless you are like an Apache expert in tune it. We're going to put in something new there. MySQL, MySQL is awesome, but has really shitty configuration settings by default out of the box. If you're not a MySQL expert, it's gonna, you're going to have to become one if you want to scale. And really what you want to do is write code, not become a DBA, unless you want to become a DBA. Then you can do that too, but really you don't want to do that. Uh, and then the last part is our trusted PHP programming language that we all love to hate. We'll keep that, but maybe we can do something better there. Maybe we can uh, make it faster. Maybe we can change some settings, make it more tunable, get some more visibility in what's happening with PHP. So what does that, that new stack look like? It looks like this. I propose the Lumpurpurn stack. Not a lot of vowels, um, so it's not catchy. I don't think it's going to catch on. Don't Google that because you won't find anything. But what we actually do is we take Linux, we add that tuning I talked about. We use Nginx instead of Apache because Nginx is this really awesome web server. We'll talk about more about that later. Instead of using PHP that's built into Apache, that's part of Apache, like right inside the core with mod PHP, we use this new technology, PHP FPM, uh, Fast CGI Process Manager. We'll talk about that more. We'll get rid of MySQL proper and we'll use Kirkona, which is an open source fork of MySQL that's a drop and replacement. It's really incredible. We'll add a caching layer. We'll use Redis. You can use Memcache if you like. But we'll add this caching layer that'll take some load off our database. That'll make our data workbase more reliable because less things will be using it. And then we'll add this idea of doing background work. PHP is single thread. is Single process, there's no threads, right? So you can't say, oh, I want to do this thing that takes a lot of time. I'll do it in the background and then respond to the client and let that background work finish later, right? PHP, if you want to do something time consuming like post a comment to Twitter, which takes a couple seconds, you have to say, hey, browser that's talking to me, hold on for two seconds while I make this API call and wait for that. This background processing asynchronous work layer lets us do that stuff in the background, and we can get back to our clients really fast and say, hey, everything's cool, I'm going to post your comment to Twitter, and post your comment to Twitter in the background. So we add that, that sort of worker layer. And what it ends up looking like is maybe something like this. This is a terrible flowchart. Uh, but we have this idea of an Nginx load balancer at the top. All of our traffic funnels through that. That Nginx load balancer funnels it out to our app servers, which are Nginx, running Nginx and PHP FPM. And that's really awesome because those are horizontally scalable. You don't need to worry about your code because if your code sucks, you can just add more app servers. You don't need to worry about it being slow. That 5% performance improvement you might get by spending hours and hours and hours pouring over your, over your code, doesn't matter because for 100 bucks, you just have a new app server on EC2 or whatever you use. Our app server layer, it talks to all these other layers, our NSQ uh, background queuing system, our cache layer, our MySQL server, but now we're using master-slave replication so we can scale that out and we can have more database servers and there's no single points of failure. And you may look at this and maybe you're pretty advanced and you're like, oh, Steve, listen, I already know that. But this is really important because this is like, you can go to the moon with this. This is similar to how we do things at Life360. Our stack is more advanced, but still at the core looks very similar to this. And we do close to a billion API requests per day. Now granted, that's not Facebook, but it's still pretty damn big. And then I propose that a stack like this, that architecting your PHP setup to look something like this, will get you pretty damn far before you have to worry about redesigning it and starting from scratch. So the first thing I want to talk about is how do we tune Linux, right? That's the first layer of that new LAMP stack. What do we do to tune Linux to make it better? 
it turns out that linux is pretty good nowadays, right? so a couple years ago, you'd have to go and look up all these settings and you probably wouldn't really know what you're putting in there because a lot of them you have to be have a neck beard like down to here to actually like understand what the settings do use the latest kernel, the distro doesn't matter that much but there are three settings that still make a difference that are sort of that 80 20 rule instead of having to pour over for hours i'll give you these three and this will give you most of the the benefits uh, of tuning Linux. Like I said, if you search Stack Overflow, there's settings on there that don't even make sense anymore. That you can kind of be guilty of, I've been guilty of this, is Google some settings, find some shit that I'm like, ah, oh, I don't really know what that does, but oh, I kind of understand. Oh, I guess that's good enough, I'll just see what happens, and then boom, my load balancer stops responding. I'm like, shit, shouldn't have done that. So it turns out that these settings have to change pretty frequently too. Like a good example is, if you follow like MySQL tuning, there is a setting called VM swappiness that was like, for the longest time, everyone's like, yes, you set this setting in your kernel to zero because it's really good for database performance. It you know, helps the database from stopping the swap. But people that talk about it online, they really don't exactly understand what it does. They kind of understand what it does. And it turns out that like three months ago, the kernel team made a change, and now that setting is bad for database performance. But hey, if you weren't on top of that, if you weren't like following those Linux kernel threads, which Hell, I don't do that, a lot of people don't do that. You wouldn't know, you'd be running the setting that you thought was good for performance, but actually was bad for performance. So don't listen to settings online, don't go on Stack Overflow and pick some shit. Do these three, these are true and tried and trusted, and you'll be good. So open files. Everything in Linux is a file, right? So someone connects to your server that uses a file, essentially, your, your PHP code talks to MySQL, that uses a file. And on Linux, you can only have 1,024 open files per process. Well, that really sucks if you have a lot of traffic. If you have thousands of people connecting to your server, that's really gonna suck for you and you're gonna get you know max number of open files uh, used and now your, your code, your Nginx server will stop responding, your code will start sucking. You need to change this. I have go in and hit this file, you bump the limit to 65K. I used to have 999,000 in here because it doesn't matter what the number is, but people would be like, oh, Steve, that's too high, whatever, it's not real. So I put 65K because it looks more believable, but the point is you need to set that to a really high number. <laughs> okay, so the next, the other two settings that are part of your uh, kernel tuning is to change SOMAXCON, which is your TCP backlog, that's basically uh, connections that are coming in that are waiting in the backlog to be accepted. By default, it's 128. So you have like maybe a little flip, your servers are a little overloaded. After 128 people are waiting in line to connect to your server, it's just gonna start dropping. Your server's gonna say, oh, oh well, sorry I'm busy, I can't respond to you. Bump that up to a high number. Again, I used to have 999,000 here, but people were like, oh, that's not believable, so 65K looks more believable. It's good enough to set it high. Like a lot of stuff you'll find online, I'll be like, oh, to go back to what I previously said, tune this network thing, blah, 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 blah. What they don't mention is that in the most recent kernels, it automatically tunes that for you, and it's probably gonna be do a better job than any of us are gonna do. The last thing, and this is a little bit outdated, is to swap out the default I.O. schedule. So Linux has uh, a tunable I.O. schedule. And it used to be that it was default to CFQ, which is like a fair scheduler. Um, and if you're running MySQL, you're like, why would I possibly want a fair scheduler? Because I want MySQL to have all of the performance, all of the I.O. available. So if you are running an old server, and you haven't changed this, you can see like a 50% boost in MySQL performance just by changing the I.O. scheduler to deadline. And you don't need to know like exactly what it does because honestly, I don't know exactly the differences. All I know is that you can take a server that's like crying, that's like, please God, someone help me, I'm so overloaded, that is running CFQ scheduler, switch it up for deadline, and it will instantly say, oh wow, I have so much available resources and have tons of free CPU, tons of free IOPS. So again, you probably, this is like default that it's deadline now, but if you have an old server, this is worth investigating. So that's it for Linux. We've tuned Linux. Uh, it's good enough, it works good. Let's talk about the next piece of our new stack, which is Nginx. Hopefully a lot of people here already use Nginx, but if you're not, you missed the boat, you need to get on it. Nginx is an awesome open source 
web server, replaces apache. a lot of people are like, oh steve, but it's really it's really confusing. the configuration is a lot harder than apache. and that's wrong. it's not. the configuration is like actually a lot easier and if you spend like half an hour looking at it, you'll see that it actually makes a lot more sense. just don't look at it like it's an apache config like one to one. it's a whole new style, but it's very easy to configure. um apache is the world's most popular web server, but and nginx is the, the most popular web server of the top one thousand websites. Uh, because for a good reason, it can do fifteen thousand requests per second using like no resources at all. it has the lowest footprint of any software i've pretty much ever used. Um, here's just a quick screenshot in case you don't believe me. this is an nginx load balancer. i don't know how well you can see, but basically you see nginx running. It's using like no CPU, it's using barely any memory, yet it has 17,390 concurrent connections that are actually like doing stuff, that are like talking to backend servers. And it's balancing all that traffic with hardly any memory usage and hardly any CPU. You can probably play like World of Warcraft or Quake or something <laughs> on here while it's serving your traffic. Also, what's cool about Nginx, right? Like, I like to keep my stack really simple. I don't like to have all this software varnish and um, HA proxy and all this specialized load balancing software. Nginx is cool because it does all that automatically built in. So it can be a load balancer, it can be an HTTP cache. What I've done before is I've put it in front of Amazon S3, which is really expensive when you're using it for like a lot of traffic, and had it cache that data locally and only go out to S3 if it really needed that data if it didn't have it locally. You can use it as a fast CGI proxy to talk to PHP. You can use it to serve, you know, basic static websites. It does everything and it's really fast. So like compared to Varnish, I think Varnish is like 5% faster. If you don't know what Varnish is, good. You don't need to bother because you have Nginx. If you do use Varnish, you can simplify your entire stack by using Nginx for everything. Maybe not everything. So that's it for Nginx. It's awesome. You should use it. Now let's talk about PHP, right? So PHP, uh, when you use Apache, it's built into Apache. They actually literally take PHP and shove it inside Apache, and your code runs right there. It kind of sucks if you are like into services and like a SOA architecture where you break things into small app. It's that's like an anti-pattern to use PHP in that fashion. Luckily, Nginx doesn't do that. Nginx doesn't know anything about PHP. You have to tell Nginx to talk to some other server or some other daemon on your server um, that runs your PHP code. Luckily, PHP solves that for us because in 5.3 they have what's called FPM, which is the best CGI process manager. Basically, it takes your PHP code, wraps it up into a daemon that runs on your server, and talks to Nginx over a fast CGI. So if you're into services, this is really cool because it isolates your application out of the web server. Everything is, is kind of isolated and, um, and runs as a daemon. So when you use PHP FPM, you have to configure a pool of workers, right? PHP doesn't have threads. If you want to serve more than one web request at a time, you need to have workers that are kind of waiting there, willing to take requests when they commit. You can spend all day learning how to configure PHP FPM. There's different types of pools. There's static pools and dynamic pools, and there's uh, there's a new like on-demand pool. Easy way is this: you take the number of CPU cores, uh, multiply that by four, and that gives you how many PHP workers you should have. So in this case, we have a static pool, 128 workers. That means that you could have 128 concurrent web requests at the same time that are coming in, you don't have availability to serve them. So like this on a modern server, 128 workers would probably let you do like thousands of requests per second. Also, PHP as a community, we're really bad about staying up to date with versions. Like if you're into Ruby, like everyone's like, oh, Ruby 2.1-P24 is out today, I better go upgrade ASAP immediately and upgrade production as well. PHP guys, like we don't tend to do that, which sucks. So like you'll see sites that are still running 5.3 or 5.4, and just because, just because like the feature set is pretty much similar doesn't change. I'll tell you this: PHP 5.4 is like 20% faster than 5.3, <coughs> and 5.5 is like 10 to 15% faster than 5.4. So you're missing out. If you're using 5.3, you're missing out on 
double performance improvement, like so not double, but yeah, like it's stacked. <laughs> so here is using 5.3. Raise your hands, anyone? <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> so also in 5.5, .5, uh, we have the Zen Opcache, which is built into 5.5. .5. We used to have where PHP would cache opcodes, it would cache all this stuff using APC, and you had to build this as an extension. Um, now it's built into PHP, so it's cool. Like when your code executes the first time, it takes all those those uh, compiled PHP opcodes and it caches them in memory. So the next time that same code needs to get run, it says, "Oh, I already have this in memory. I don't need to recompile it or reinterpret it. I already have it." What's cool is that Zen opcache, which which comes for free in 5.5, is 10 to 20 percent faster than APC. So on top of those performance gains from 5.4 and 5.5, you also get another free performance gain because Zen Opcache is faster than APC. It's really cool. I've written extensively about Zen Opcache uh, on my blog. I'll link to it at the end and you can check it out. But if you do things like deployment with Capistrano maybe, um, there's a lot of gotchas with Zen Opcache um, that are like a pain in the ass to talk about, a pain in the ass to discuss. But you can check it out on the blog afterwards. Um, also with Opcache, there's like a million and one settings you can tune in. The documentation is horrible. It's really bad. It's like the documentation will be like kill uh, kill strings, and you're like, what does that even do? That makes no sense. And there's no documentation. So uh, I have a blog post also that documents like each of those. I had to read the source to do it, and it sucks. So check that out after if you you send Opcache or into using it. So with the stack, right, we can scale PHP horizontally because. Like I said, your code doesn't matter. You just pay 100 bucks to Amazon or whoever, and you add another app server, and now all of a sudden you have more performance without worrying about your code. That's awesome. That's horizontal scaling. That's really kick-ass. But what you need to do is watch out for sessions when you do that, right? By default, uh, PHP sessions, like someone comes to your site, they get a cookie with the session ID, you store a little data, uh, PHP puts that on the file system. So when you have a lot of servers, and that kind of sucks because if you go to the website and hit server A, your session gets saved there, and then you go to a different page, and now you hit server B, and it has no session because your session data is stored on server A, right? What people will say is, oh, store your sessions in MySQL. Oh, store your sessions on network file system. And you'll find that a lot, and those are terrible ideas. Don't do that. <laughs> what you should do is Memcache and Redis have built-in PHP session extensions. You can just plug your sessions into Memcache and Redis, and bam, all of a sudden you have this distri distributed session pool, and you don't need to worry about where the files get stored and who, what server has what data. Now all of your servers share a Memcache pool for your sessions, and whatever server the user goes to will have that session data. Some people also do this horrible thing called uh, sticky sessions, where if user, the user comes in and they hit server A, the next time they come in, it'll always redirect them to server A, and it'll kind of split the users up and always send them to the, the server they were connecting to, and that also sucks. Just use Memcache, just use Redis. If you use NFS for sessions or MySQL, let me know so I can punch you in the face after this. <laughs> or just, maybe just the shoulder. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is this fallacy of PHP and MySQL. Right? You read online. You, uh, I'm sure you all have maybe looked sometime. You go and you're like, oh, how do I connect to MySQL? What's this option for persistent connections? Let me Google that. You Google it, and people on the internet are like, no, never use persistent connections. They, they suck. They don't work. And you can never really find a good reason, like, why? Why do they suck? Why don't they work? And there's no, no good information. Just everyone says they suck, and you're like, oh, well, they suck, and you don't use them. Actually, persistent connections are really good. I've benchmarked these extensively because I was confused, like, how come everyone says they're bad but doesn't give me a reason why they're bad? And when I benchmark persistent connections, which the idea is PHP connects to MySQL, and then on the next request that comes in, it saves that connection. It doesn't have to reconnect every single time someone loads your page, right? It keeps that connection open and just holds it there and, and has it persistent. The truth is, despite what the internet says, oops, uh, despite what the internet says, they're 10 to 20 percent faster on the first query. So that's a little bit of free like performance boosting enhancement you can have. Is you can use persistent connections, and now your queries are just a little bit faster. 
without really doing anything. The only thing to watch out for is that when you use persistent connections, every PHP worker has a constant connection to MySQL all of the time. So what that means is you just need to configure MySQL so that it can accept all of these connections. So if you have 10 web servers, every web server has 100 PHP workers, that's gonna be 1,000 MySQL connections. You just need to say, hey MySQL, listen man, I'm gonna give you a lot of connections, you need to be ready to ha handle 1,000 of them, just the configuration variable max connections that you can bump up. And for the most part, MySQL is like, okay, cool, sounds good. And now you have persistent connections. That's the only gotcha. Outside of that, anyone that tells you that MySQL persistent connections and PHP are bad is wrong. Next, MySQL. Uh, we get rid of MySQL on this thing, right? We're, we keep it, but we get rid of it. We use Percona. Percona is an open source fork. It's a drop and replacement. You basically just drop it in and nothing else changes except now you're like 100% more awesome. Because it has patches from Twitter, Google, and a bunch of other people, has like really awesome configuration knobs and switches that you can use to get more performance out of MySQL with more sane settings. It's a drop and replacement, like I said, it's faster, more scalable, more reliable. Here's a graph, and this is old and doesn't really tell you much except we see two lines, and one of them is higher than the other line, so it must be better, right? But really this is like number of trans transactions over time, the blue line is MySQL proper, the red line is Percona. Uh, you'll see that over time, Percona A has more transactions per second, but also is more consistently performant, right? MySQL has these stalls where it stalls and there's checkpoints and the performance tanks like a rock and then picks back up. Percona fixes a lot of these nasties where that you have that inconsistent performance and just gives you straight line performance. If you did this, this is a this graph is a little bit old. If you benchmark this with like more recent versions, the gap would be even bigger. Kirkona is amazing, it has really good um, hot backups built in, it has a lot of stuff, like if you've ever tried to add a column on a production database and learn the hard way, that really sucks hard. Kirkona has some tools to make that a little better. Some other tips around MySQL is only use InnoDB, so MySQL has um, a couple different storage engines, InnoDB is one of them. It's really the only one you should ever use in production. The other ones, there's not a lot of good use cases, but it's, they're the default ones. Are the ones that aren't good are the default ones. Like That doesn't make any sense. So it's something to be conscious of. Also, worth mentioning, I always laugh at this, but MySQL has a query cache. Percona has a query cache, right? And it's the most worth, worthless thing. The query cache in MySQL uh, basically queries come in, it's like, oh, let me cache that data in case you make that query again, I can just give it back to you. The thing is, every time you write new data, it doesn't say like, oh, let me figure out what data you wrote and like what data I have to remove from the, the cache. It just says, oh, there's new data, fuck it, and deletes all the data in the cache. So if you write data into your MySQL database and you have the query cache on, and say you write like one new piece of data every second, Every second, you're just dumping the query cache in the toilet and flushing it. Now imagine if you have a lot of writes coming into your database. You're doing, I don't know, a uh, hundred new pieces of data you're storing every every second or something like that. You're constantly thrashing and dumping your query cache over and over and over again, and it actually becomes a bottleneck. Your query cache becomes the reason why your database is slow, because it uses all these locks and all this shit. So turn off the query cache, disable it, that's a tip. The other thing I can give you is MySQL has this unknown feature called pool of threads. You use a thread pool, it, it reuses the threads that, um, that it has previously created. This is really cool if you didn't listen to my advice on um, using persistent connections because every new connection creates a new thread. If you use pool of threads, you can just reuse those threads instead of creating a new thread every single time one of your PHP pieces of code or whatever that talks to MySQL, uh, creates a new thread for that, you can reuse those with pool of threads. Also, uh, hopefully everyone here, if you are using MySQL, your MySQL databases use SSDs. Uh, welcome to the 21st century because you need to stop wasting your time and use SSDs because uh, they, will, they will save you from so many scaling headaches. Like, uh, one of my stories is that when I was learning how to scale, I basically had to sleep next to my laptop uh, for a year to roll over in the middle of the night, 
restart Apache, and like, it sucked. I didn't sleep for a long time. If I had, was like, oh, let me just spend a couple hundred more bucks and use SSDs, I would have saved myself like hundreds of hours of sleep because they will take all these really hard scaling problems and push them off way into the distance when you can like just pay people to figure out those problems. So use SSDs. Um, our caching layer, so we added caching layer to land. I like Redis. Redis is this really awesome, uh, basically sort of like an in-memory uh, data structure server. You can take any piece of data, store it into Redis, and get it back some time in the future. Uh, and it's you know, persistent. A lot of people use memcache. They, they cache things in memcache. You can use that too, but Redis is better. It's really, really fast. 500k uh, gets per second. Uh, what's cool about Redis, so I've had this problem, maybe uh, some of you have familiarity with this, but you have like memcache and you're like, oh, this is so awesome, I'm caching, I'm storing a lot of data in the cache uh, from you know maybe things you pull out of MySQL that are really expensive to generate. You put them in memcache, and you're like, cool, that's great. And then you have to, for some reason, memcache crashes, crashes or you have to restart memcache and you lose all that data, and then your database since that data is not cached anymore because you restarted and lost it all, your database is like, oh hell, geez, there's so much, so many connections, and you're asking me for so much data because you don't have the cache anymore. Because when you restart memcache, it just flushes it all down the toilet. Redis is cool because it stores all that data to disk. So if you have to restart Redis, it starts back up and it has all that data again. You don't need to worry about losing the data in your cache. It saves you from a lot of uh, waking up. Redis is cool because the configuration out of the box is pretty great. Um, it's really scalable just by default. The only piece of advice I can give you, and I learned this like everything else the hard way, is that if you run it on EC2, um, if you there's two different kinds of instances on EC2. There's a PV para-virtualized and an HVM instance. On PV instances, forking a process is super expensive. It takes like three or four seconds if your process has like 40 gigs of memory or something like that, and it will stall. Like every time Redis has to fork, it will just stall and take a couple seconds to respond. Use HVM instances if you're going to do Redis. They're a little bit more expensive on EC2, uh, but it's worth saving yourself from the pain. There's a lot of um, PHP libraries for Redis. The best one is Peckle Redis. It's a Peckle extension. Installation is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward to use. Uh, I highly recommend if you are using Memcache to use Redis. Uh, as a replacement if you can, because all around I find it to be better. There's not really a lot of cases I can think of where um, memcache is a better uh, thing to use than Redis. And then the last thing I want to talk about uh, is the background worker layer of PHP. Like how do we do work in the background in PHP since PHP doesn't do threading, right? Like if I want to do something that's really expensive, like post a comment to Twitter, how do I do that without making the browser or the mobile client or whoever, how do I do that without making them wait? Um, the solution to this, I think, is NSQ, which is a, a background queuing daemon written by Bitly. It's in Golang. We use it to do 800 million events a day. You can argue with me on this. Like People use Rescue. Um, people use Gearman. People use Kestrel. People use Beanstalk. There's a lot of solutions for queuing in PHP. I think NSQ is the best, but you can convince me of otherwise uh, with the heat um, so if you use NSQ, NSQ PHP is the best PHP library. It has a pub sub model, blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's just basic, like, doing asynchronous work. What NSQ has that's really cool is it has this idea of doing, like, HTTP callbacks. So you can take a piece of data, drop it into NSQ, and configure it with an endpoint in your PHP code. And without having to write any code, it will just take your message and repost it back to a different endpoint. So say you were posting comments to Twitter. One, your PHP code it could, would come in and say, oh, I have this comment I want to post. Here's the body of the comment. Put it into NSQ. And then your PHP would also have another controller that was web accessible that would actually you know, be like slash comments, post to Twitter, whatever. It would actually do that logic of posting the comment to Twitter. NSQ would take your message with the comment and automatically post it into that endpoint that posts it to Twitter. It's like just kind of like webhooks, internal webhooks for your backend. It's really neat. Here's a screenshot. Uh, there's really nothing here to show except like NSQ has really nice visibility. 
which is really important with asynchronous work. Like a lot of times you can have a, uh, a background queue, but you really can't see into it. You don't know exactly what it's doing. You don't know how many jobs are failed. Um, NSQ gives you this really nice dashboard where you can see like, oh, we did 416 million messages here, and 175,000 were requeued, and how many failed, and how many are processing right now. The visibility is really clutch. When we talk about background queues, a lot of people are like, oh, Steve, I could just write that in MySQL myself. I just need a table, I can put some work in it, and then have something else that reads out of it. And that's wrong, that's entirely wrong. And it's hard to like visualize, but unless you do, unless you get all of the locks and such perfect, you're gonna fuck up. I've tried this myself. I'm not above trying this. And I had uh, the, I used it to post pictures to Twitter. And when I did that, I posted duplicate pictures of like the same jobs I put in would get run over and over again multiple times because I'd screw up the locking because I wouldn't get it right. Use a work queue that's designed for doing background work. Don't try to implement it yourself in MySQL, because if you're like me, you will fuck that up. That brings me back to my original point. I know this is a lot to take in, and there's a lot of uh, more back end stuff and not PHP stuff, but my original point is don't scale your code. Doesn't matter, code's easy to scale. Looking up like, how do I make PHP faster is like the, it's like the pickup lines of scaling, right? It's like the magic weight loss pill. Your code is fast enough, it's easy and cheap to scale your code. What you need to do is become intimate with your LAMP stack, become intimate with your infrastructure and your DevOps, and learn how to do that stuff because that's where all the low hanging fruit is. What I gave you was a quick 80-20 of how to like, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh shit, I'm on Reddit and there's, you know, there's a million, not browsing Reddit, but like I've been posted to Reddit and there's a million people coming to my website and what do I do, I'm so screwed. I hope you can take this presentation and browse through it and like make some quick changes in a half an hour that will get you back up again. That's really the point of this, is that you can scale your infrastructure really easily because there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. So I hope you got something out of this. I hope there's something valuable. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad I could talk to you guys. If you like this kind of stuff, I wrote a book on it. I won't give you the hard sell, but it's scalingphpbook.com. Uh, I just moved here, so follow me on Twitter, ask me to Corona, and it's really a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you. If you don't have any questions, I do. I'd love to take any questions. Yes, sir. Can you talk about the difference between Corona and not to be with the Maria TV? Like, what do you think is better? Why? Yeah, so the question was, in case everyone here, was the differences between Corona and Maria DB. Uh, MariaDB is like another fork of MySQL, actually by the original MySQL guy. Um, the difference is, I think that MariaDB is heading in a more interesting direction where um, they're actually replacing a lot of the core components of MySQL and eventually it won't be like an exact drop and replacement. Uh, that being said, they're pretty similar, right? Like they share a lot of the same work that has come out, um, it, it, like the you know, the patches to MySQL that have come out, they share a lot of the same ones. Personally, I always go for Percona because it's so well backed by the community. Percona, you know, they, uh, the company itself has a huge investment into Percona. They have people that can help you um, if you if you need consultants or whatever. That being said, they're both really equally awesome choices and you'll probably have similar experiences with both of them. Does, yes, does NSQ have like persistence to it? Or if it crashes and you just lose I think uh, off the top of my head, I believe that it persists to disk. It also uh, shares, so you have a bunch of NSQ daemons that are running on different boxes. So it becomes distributed by nature because if you only lose one, that all of that work or those messages are shared between all of the boxes. So uh, you don't even really fall into that scenario if you just lose one box. But I do believe that if all of them fail, it's pers at least some of the data the messages persist to disk. So I, I don't know if I cut all that, but you said, uh, I mentioned using SSDs. 
the Linux kernel caches data into memory. And then what was the last part? Well, um, yeah, so, I mean, of course, it's really uh, to use SSDs, but you're still using hard drives. I mean, how much performance uh, basically gets into an SSD when the kernel already like, caches your IO in the RAM like, as much as it can? Yeah, so, um, it, that, so the question was, like, how do SSDs, or how does even hard drives, um, how does it impact your performance if your kernel can cache all of that data into memory anyways? And the answer is, if you have less data than you do memory, you're in a good spot, right? You don't really need to worry about it too much because you're right. Eventually, as you read all of that data in, it will get cached into memory and you will hit disk less and less and less and less, kind of transparently. Also, MySQL has its own buffer cache outside of the kernel caching that MySQL will also cache that data into memory. So to answer your question, um, if you have less data, less data than you do memory, you don't need to worry about it too much. The second, though, that you spill over and you have more data than you have memory, you're screwed if you're, if you're trying to do anything high performance. It, you're not using SSDs in my opinion. It gets a lot harder as soon as you don't have enough memory. Now granted, it's easier now, right? Because you can get a server with 500 gigs of memory for like pretty cheap. It's not that expensive compared to how much it used to be years ago. So that gap gets bigger and bigger, um, but still, like, once you have less memory than you have disk that you're using, you need to start worrying about more and more. The, the kernel um, page cache, cache can't save you as much. Uh, when you're choosing Linux, do you ever play with like, the TCP slow start? Yeah, so uh, I have and I've recommended like a lot of different TCP settings around the slow start and uh, the time wait stuff. And a lot of, you know, I always used to recommend that. that you, should, you should do that, you should tune this. Uh, the reason why I took it out of this, out of the slides, was I just read uh, a really good in-depth like how exactly from like call to call in the kernel, how that works. Um, and it turns out like it was way more complicated than I imagined. It's, there's a lot more that it impacts than I originally had planned. Like ins instead of being a cure-all, like hey, just do this and you'll like be in a better state. It turns out that's not the case. And there's a lot of edge cases around um, around that specifically that it can screw you up. Uh, but yeah, like you can tune some of the slow start. You can tune some of the, the TCP window stuff um, and get. Uh, get good performance out of it, but you start to enter that realm of like, you really need to understand what you're doing, um, which is great if you want to spend a lot of time and investment in it. I personally don't. I personally uh, like to take the 8 20 rule. Yeah. But yeah, you definitely could play with that and get, get uh, good results. Anyone else? Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.